Okay, it is four o'clock. I'm going to turn it over to Monty and Prudence. Enjoy, everyone. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. My name is Monty Paulson. I'm grateful to report that myself, my family, and my awesome team here at RDH Building Science have survived another week. We're healthy and happy, though some of us may be baking a bit much. Some of us may be gaining weight. I'm not naming names. I'm just saying there's a reason you don't see my waistline. So let's start with uh, cheers. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the social. Cheers. I'd like to remind you all to please turn your cameras on and your microphones off. I'd like to thank Passive House Accelerator for hosting this very important party every week. We have a great lineup tonight. Uh, we have a short video by Michael Ngui, a tour of a Passive House project in Britain. We are really keen to see more of you make uh, Passive House tours. We have a fanta uh, fantastic presentation by Sally Godber from Warm Low Energy Building Practice. Uh, Sally's one of my heroes. I'll tell you more about that later. And I'd now like to introduce my co-host, Prudence Ferreira. Hi everyone, I'm Prudence. I'm the uh, Passive House Practice Lead at Morrison Hirschfield. Welcome to the sixth week of the best Passive House happy hour on earth. I have to confess, I, I'm kind of loving this new work environment that allows me to wear my Passive House Accelerator t-shirt all, right. all week long with sweats. Yes. <laughs> In fact, uh, tonight, First time ever, as Monty mentioned, we all get to go on a Passive House drinking tour without even leaving home, thanks to our Passive House Accelerator founder, Michael Ingui. We all love seeing those Passive House buildings, so do your part and invite us all over for a cocktail at your Passive House project. Send in your two-minute video and we'll all toast you. So everyone, grab your drink and come along to Michael's house. In this area of Brooklyn, you've got front yards leading up to the houses. That mansard's been added. Bike shed. You come up the stoop, passive house door, Zola, historic opening. There's a lot of details to be shown for this at another time. Look at the tight fit. Contractor must have loved me. And then we go into the parlor floor. On the parlor floor, we took out some floor area. This looks down at the kitchen and dining room below. People thought we were crazy to take off floor area, but these are narrow houses. They're only 16 wide, so they make them feel big. You've got to take out some floor area. Really large lift and slides, nice screen. This was by Zola. Some really interesting steel details here and sill details here that I'll share in a future presentation. Out onto the rear yard. You can see some reclaimed pavers below from another project, some existing plantings, and finally some reclaimed brick from this facade with some tilt and turn windows above. Here we are in the rear yard. You can see properly shaded southern exposure, really large lift and slides, rain screen. You can't really see the black membrane behind it but rain screen with two inches of rigid insulation, concrete block walls. Heading into the kitchen, you can start to see induction cooktop and range. In the cellar, you've got a heat pump hot water heater by A.O. Smith. A few things I would have done differently with the piping. We learned about that afterwards. Mitsubishi that serves the garden floor. Again, would have done this differently. I insisted it was down here. It should be in the airtight layer. It caused a bit of problems. Um, you've got some Sega membrane. You can kind of see it right there. Going into stole gold that we painted white and then we put sheetrock on top. The airtight layer is there because I am a painter and I did not want the fumes to travel upstairs. And we've got the Zola airtight door right here. Keep all the fumes out. As we enter the laundry room, we've got a bunch of things. I could go on and on about the heat pump dryer. Again, for another presentation, access to a Mitsubishi, nice and easy to get to. Exhaust port for the ERV, and ERV, easy to get to with the two ports. Zender going up top. Here we are on the roof. This is about to get 
a large solar canopy. Once they allow us to start building in New York City, you can see our Mitsubishi wall hung nice and easy. We really didn't have to heat this winter, but um, or last winter, but it definitely provides a good cooling. And then access to the rest of the house through the bulkhead door. Check out the sound difference. Anyway, thanks, folks. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Michael. So I, I want to, um, this is Zach here, I want to uh, just propose a quick toast to Earth Day. Just a second. Get, uh, and uh, not Hallmark Earth Day, but real Earth Day, the spirit of that first Earth Day back in 1970. And this was a time of crisis, of social unrest, burning rivers, the fear for human health. And all that set the backdrop for a huge nonviolent uprising. The first Earth Day involved 20 million Americans, fully 10% of the U.S. population. It scared Richard Nixon into signing the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, and more. The EPA and other institutions were born then, and it was a huge leap forward. Today, we're also in crisis with unrest, fear for our health, and deep concern about the planet. The stakes are higher. But the conditions are set to make a huge leap forward, just like in 1970, this time at a global scale. All of us want to make that leap in the building sector. So in that sense, every day is Earth Day. But even more important is what we do collectively leading up to election day everywhere. That's our new Earth Day. Just ask Dennis Hayes the organizer of Earth Day 1970. So in that spirit and with a nod to Dennis, let's raise a glass. Thank you. All right, so we are going to break into some breakout rooms real quick. We're gonna, these are gonna be quick, but this gives you a chance to um, introduce yourself and kind of rapid fire um, manner, and um, if you have time uh, to maybe share a reflection about Earth Day. These are going to be, uh, like I say, fast. Um, we're probably three minutes or so. Oh, let's see. Here we go. See you in three minutes. Okay, so I think that we are mainly back here. I, so I want to um, do some really fast announcements here, and then we're going to um, get into the meat of the program here. So one is that, um, uh, you know, for self-care and also maybe to stay rational and counter the negative negativity bias that is natural in human psychology, uh, we've got the Earth Optimism uh, Summit that is starting. It's actually going on right now. There's a um, film festival tonight and then um, some great programming with names like Bill McKibben and uh, Jamie Margolin and many, many others uh, tomorrow and Friday. So uh, you can check that out at earthoptimism.si.edu. Uh, abstracts for FIAS's North American Pacifist Conference are due in a few days on April 27th. So go to fias.org for details about that. Um, the folks at Living Future and the Living Building Challenge, you know, this, these, this is a, Living Building Challenge and Passive House are really kindred spirits, both very um, uh, uh, ambitious approaches to building. Of course, there are lots of differences in our approaches, but there's a lot of um, complementarity as well. Their online uh, conference is May 7th and 8th. I'm gonna be at the whole thing and I would love to see others there. Um, and there's a discount code there if you're interested. Um, and NAPHN is having a certified Passive House Designer training on May 11th through 15th online. Um, so please visit uh, NAPHN know. Network for details. And finally, a, a shout out to our founding sponsors, Mitsubishi Electric, Zola Windows, RDH Building Science uh, for generous support of our work, as well as um, thank you to our patron sponsors, Morrison, Hirsch, Morrison Hirschfield and 475. And with that, I'll hand it off. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate, the, appreciate the hint there. I also really appreciate what you said, Zach, about um, 
this is the time to try new ideas. I actually spent most of the day on a small team discussing ideas with the city of Vancouver that were kind of undiscussable only six weeks ago, but now under the guise of stimulus and pilot programs, many new things are suddenly able to be talked about. Um, it is my absolute privilege to introduce Sally Godber, a PHI accredited building service fire and mechanical building services engineer. Sally set up WARM with her father, Peter, back in 2009. WARM provides passive house design advice and certification, but also dabbles in building services, training, monitoring, and anything else that improves buildings. WARM has been one of my heroes for a decade. When I started in passive house here in Canada, there was no passive house Canada. There was no training. There was no exam. You just had to kind of figure it out by yourself. At the time, I was running a struggling home energy modeling business with two very young children to feed. And so I would be up literally in the middle of the night using a search engine that predated Google called Alta Vista, which is going to date me a bit, desperately trying to find more about Passive House. And most of what I found was in German. And Google Translate hadn't been invented yet, of course. So then I found Warm. And Warm's website from the early days was this flood of tools and tips and little calculators and sheets. But more importantly, Warm was this proof that people were out there making a living as PassFuzz consultants. And uh, in like 2011, 2012, that was hugely encouraging to me. I felt like when Spider-Man discovered Stone Tony Stark. And so let me introduce to you the Captain Marvel of Passive House, Sally. Wow, thank you. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to follow this up, um, Monty, but that's a really <laughs> lovely starter. I've been given um, the um, privilege of talking to you about a project which is really close to my heart, so I'm going to start sharing with you now. Um, um, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, this is... Um, a, I've been told I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to kind of do whistle t stop tour of this. The, and there's a lot that I'm not going to talk about. It's called Goldsmith Street in Norwich. Um, and here we go. So there's lots of stuff I'm not going to talk about, um, but I'm going to talk about mostly the kind of initial design stages and how kind of Passive House influenced the design, because uh, that's really the kind of the big where the big hitters come into the project. Um, so, oh, before we go into that, just to say what our role was, um, we worked as um, Passive House consultants on the project and we also um, did the mechanical services design for this. Um, we're based um, about six hours away from the site as well. So this was, and it's 105 dwellings. So it was a really big thing for us to take this on, to be confident that we could do a good job of it. Um, but the client was just so committed to doing something really well that we were were kind of we couldn't turn it down really so there's some really key parts of this project which are not related to passive house at all but uh, ultimately kind of really bring uh, turn it into something that's very special and the most important one of these is the spaces between the streets and um, they're very long terraces and they've created really beautiful spaces that really um, uh, make sure that there's engagement between the occupants and that there is all the stuff that we are starting to experience now with Without having cars um, flying around everywhere um, so a lot of that has kind of gone into the design so that's a really key thing they also were slightly bigger than uh, kind of standard UK homes but the main thing was kind of this external layout stuff and here's another view showing um, typical again kind of really great use of external space between the um, the buildings and um, we've got a range across the site of um, houses um, about 50% of them, so we've got about 50 houses on the site and we've got about 50 flats which are in these uh, kind of bookend bits or I don't know what you call those architecturally. So that, that's kind of where we sit. And looking from the air, this is what it looks like. You can see here the, um, the long terraces, uh, the flats at the end of each one. And uh, what was really great from our perspective was that the layout of the site meant that we could um, orientate the terraces um, to the south and to the north. And we'll talk about why that's so important to start um, further down the line. 
Now, when we got involved, there were already had been some work done on the design and the architects had really got hold of this concept of solar design and trying to maximise the solar um, uh, gain from across this site. And they had set out the spaces between the, um, the terraces. They didn't have as long terraces as we showed now, but the spaces between them were really kind of quite nice spaces. So we had the street, garden and street spaces between the two um, and this was kind of a great starting point from our perspective we weren't so keen on the massive amounts of solar gain but in terms of the kind of streetscape that seemed to work really well for us um, there's a load of stuff that goes into the design uh, and kind of influences um, from a passive house perspective but I'm going to pick the two real big hitters so I'm going to talk about form and complexity and orientation and glazing so it's kicking off this was the original scheme so terraces definitely a thumbs up from us in terms of passive house makes life an awful lot easier um, and a lot of repetition there already which was a great starter so that was what was good about the scheme. There were some things which weren't really ideal. And the first of these was the depth from front to back of the building. And because this was, they were narrow, it meant that the heat loss area that we had was relatively high. Um, and comparing that to another project that we were looking at, um, which we'd just completed, Raynham, um, the difference was um, 1.5 kilowatt hours per meter squared per hour and now a year. Now I meant to turn this into something which is kind of meaningful for you, but that's kind of a tenth of the heat loss of our kind of our heat loss budget. Um, so there was a lot of angst about exactly what depth was okay front to back. Um, and we ended up with something that, that was slightly better than was originally proposed, but at the same time, we didn't want to push it to something that felt uncomfortable as well, because it obviously had has impacts for the layout and for the site-wide stuff as well. Um, and in a similar way, uh, one of the other things which wasn't quite ideal was um, the insulation line goes up the pitch of the roof. And because of that, we have more heat loss area than if the insulation went across the ceiling. Um, so that was kind of something which wasn't, um, wasn't the best, but it was kind of, we could suck it, suck it up. There were a lot of other things um, which we made really significant headway in and particularly um, trying to um, reduce the level of complexity across the site. And here's just a couple of examples of the kind of things that we did. So, for example, here where this is the flats, the entrance, and you can see we've got an inset door. Now, this is really difficult to do a good job of. And so we talked through this design and what we ended up doing was um, changing this so that the doorway is in line with the insulation behind the wall and then we kind of created this um, porchy bit over the top which everyone felt was like a much better solution and was much easier to build and just kind of better all round. Um, we also had these kind of pop-up roof bits which were really complicated and uh, through a lot of um, back and forth with us and the rest of the team we decided that we could get rid of half of them. Um, by making the building slightly wider and therefore kind of fitting in bedrooms and other places. Um, and there were also some bits like some pretty crazy dormer bits that women were stuck on and we managed to get rid of those too, um, which meant that we ended up with some much simpler and much more beautiful and easier to build kind of details in terms of the roof structure there on the, um, on the, the flats. So, and the complexity thing was kind of something which we were really pushing through all the way, but particularly at the beginning. So this is the a section through the housing and you can see it's kind of relatively simple. In comparison, the houses where they have the pop ups, we have um, four extra junctions in section like that. And if you take a section the other way, um, there is an additional four there. So just lots of extra bits to think about, which is not really ideal. Um, and there they are. There's what the, the kind of pop ups ended up. So the fact that we managed to get them reduced down to um, I think it's four in the end um, made a really big difference. So four across the whole scheme. So here is the site in plan. Um, and just coming back to this idea about kind of the level of repetition versus um, kind of um, variance, uh, we can see here that these are the two story houses, which are pretty much all identical. There's very little difference between type A and type D. Um, and here we have the three story ones with that pop up that was kind of a bit more complicated. So we've only got four of those across the site. 
so those from our perspective this was kind of a really massive success you know a lot of repetition here really easy for us to manage lots of opportunity for optimization then when we get onto the flats we there's just so many different variants across the site that it really felt like a lot of firefighting to try and keep on top of the design um, so, and this makes, as sites get much more bigger, as sites get bigger, this becomes much more critical um, to kind of keep it simple so that you can keep it all in your head to start with, but also the opportunity to kind of optimise and everything else. So on this particular site, um, with 50 flats, 50 homes, we reckon both for the building services design and for the kind of passive house consultancy, about 70% of our time was spent on the flats. Um, and that felt like a real shame that that opportunity to do the same thing um, and particularly to kind of really make details incredibly beautiful just was kind of limited. Um, so that meant that the houses, um, everything was kind of finely tuned and really well thought through. And then when it came to the flats, it just, it, there was a lot of firefighting and it, they look fine and, and everything works, but they were really tricky to build. They were just a lot harder work all round. So um, I know this, I don't know whether this is, I kind of, I think that you guys use the form factor as well as a kind of, in, which is an indication of how efficient a building form is. Um, so this is definitely one for the geeks. Um, this is, uh, the form factor is the heat loss area divided by the floor area. So this means the lower the number, the better. Um, it means less insulation and typically for the UK we have um, if we have a form factor of 2.4 that means we need 10 inches of insulation um, and if we have a form factor of 3 it means we need 12 inches of insulation so we kind of really definitely want to be down this end of things and this is where Goldsmith Street is um, so that's each one of the terraces shown there and this meant that it was actually quite hard to manage because we had this variation across the site so trying to find strategies for these large projects where you can vary a few simple things and everything else is the same is really important in the end for Goldsmith Street we just ended up going for and kind of oversized timber frame so that we were certain that everything was passing the other big thing, orientation and glazing. As I said, like this, um, the site meant that we could very easily orientate um, these very long terraces um, facing south and north. And I mean, this just made me so incredibly happy. This emoji does not do it justice how kind of happy I was. And the reason for that is um, the impact uh, for the UK on uh, summertime comfort. So here we have a graph to kind of try and explain this. Um, if we have, um, I'm just interested really in the summertime because actually the winter time, you can see that the solar gains don't really vary an awful lot depending on orientation. They do a bit, but no, no big deal, kind of, it doesn't really matter. This is for a house where the amount of glazing on the front and the back is exactly the same. So it's kind of, it's got, or it's got glazing because it's a terrace it's got glazing on both aspects and it's kind of being moved around in comparison when we look at the summertime and we have a building which is facing north and south in comparison the same building with the same glazing facing east and west is significantly higher solar gains so that means in terms of keeping buildings comfortable in the summertime orientation is key and if you have buildings which are facing east and west you just have to work an awful lot harder so because this was social housing and we didn't know who was going to be moving into it um, summer comfort was kind of really high on the priorities so the orientation we were like big tick amazing then we started talking to the architects about glazing and this was their first sketch that they sent through to us and as i said before they were kind of completely obsessed with the idea of um, capturing as much solar gain as they possibly could ah! um, so we had to have some quiet words about that and kind of basically say that the amount of glass that they were proposing putting on here just really wasn't appropriate at all um, for um, you know small any housing really um, and here's the heat loss uh, 
uh, the breakdown of it and you can see is the windows are absolutely dominating the heat loss as well so this would have been if they'd have built it like this it would be incredibly com uncomfortable in the summertime and the winter time so we had a kind of um we had lots of back and forth between us and the team to try and work out what we felt okay about in terms of the glazing and about halfway through we ended up with something that looked like this now these two are bedrooms up here and personally I'm not that keen on seeing anything below the waistline in my bedroom so um, the uh, and also this still was from our perspective massively overglazed and we were really worried about the the, com the summer comfort so we went back and we did some calculations looking at the daylight levels within there and we kind of said well something like this is probably more appropriate this is going to give you the right level of daylighting and everything else and they said oh well yeah that's that's okay we could deal with that but actually what we really want is this and so we said mm, okay well we can do that but you have to have this shading thing instead if you want that that's the deal and they said okay yeah that's where we can go from so the shading here is to deal with the fact that the windows are slightly larger than they should be and the north elevation there just to show you and in a similar way we went through the kind of windows on the flats by first of all saying you just need to get rid of a whole lot of it there was loads of back and forth between us about trying to work out what the glazing should be doing what we needed from it and this is where we ended up and you can see in comparison to that original sketch you know it's it, the the glazing is really quite minimal and i think this is the real success of um uh, the project is then they had this idea about how they thought it was going to look and they were very able to kind of pull away from that and go for something else. So that's a, um, I think um, it shows a real skill. Uh, and then we have a kind of the flats. And one of the other things that I think is really lovely about these kind of porchy things is the little set in um, letterbox there. Right. So that's it. I've got no idea how long I did. Oh, 17 minutes or oh, slightly more. Um, I'm also talking about another one of our projects on the 25th of June. This is a plug for um, uh, Agar Grove, which uh, if anyone's interested, then it'll be up on the SIBSI website. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Did you all catch what she did there? She talked the owner into a better form factor, fewer junctions, and and smaller windows. If that's not a superpower, I don't know what is. <laughs> Let's take a few big picture questions for Sally from the group uh, for 10, 12 minutes or so, and then we'll go to small groups for discussion, then we'll come back for a all group closing again. Uh, Sean, do you have questions? Yeah, up? I do. I got a good list here going. Uh, Jeff, sorry, I'm not sure where you've gone, but you had the first question about density, so I'll let you ask it. Hi, well, Sally, that was wonderful. I love the collaborative aspect of it that got to a better uh, solution. Uh, my question gets to what was the population density before the project on the existing site and what did you end up with? Because that to me is the core of sustainability. Oh God, this is very embarrassing. I honestly have got no idea whatsoever. I'm just going to go back and have a look at the, um, I mean, th this is, um, I've, I spent quite a lot of time hanging out around this site. Um, and uh, it was a really scrappy, um, I mean, you can see there that the majority of um, the dwellings around about the, the majority of them are flats. Um, so it was a fairly high density, but this was, I don't know what the site was used for before, um, but it was, um, it had been dormant for a long time with nothing on it whatsoever. So it had been, yeah, I can't say, sorry. Colin had a question about why no exterior shading on the windows. Um, what beyond the, um, the shading that, uh, the the overhangs yeah, correct. beyond that so that the fact there wasn't any more um this is all to do with the fact that the windows aren't that large and this is something that took me a long time to get my head round is that shading is there as a it, certainly for the uk where actually we don't have massive amount of solar gain um shading is often there to compensate for the fact that the windows are too big um, and in 
for this particular case, um, we didn't need any more. We felt that the um, it was comfortable. Now, we did do some future climate analysis, a very, very rough stage, and um, we showed that they, they could, there, there was, there was the ability to add that in later, so some shutters or some uh, kind of more solid shading on top of the windows. But when I first asked the question, I didn't see any shading at all because they're just these horizontal slits, and so I saw zero shading, and I saw the shading. Okay. Oh, wow, well, I screwed up. So sorry. Well, no worries. It, I again, I just was clicking the questions. My preference would have been for the option without the shading um, to have the small windows with less shading because I think it's, uh, you know, th that had a lower risk of um, overheating than the option that we en ended up with. Dale, you had a question? I asked a question, yes. Can you you did. Now? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I had to turn the microphone back on. This is very advanced technology. <laughs> When Zach's talking about 1970, I was at the University of Washington and what marched in those marches. I have a different opinion than his. <laughs> so, okay. what was your question, Dale? Well, I guess this is public housing. One on one is, uh, is this going to be condominiums where people actually individually own them because they're going to treat them differently from the departments where you have a single owner? And then, did she look at a tubular lighting because that would add, without the heat loss and heat gain, more lighting into the interior, which the architects, I guess, love. And then for shading, I like the Rolandons the Germans put on the exterior of the windows. Because that Great, allows so you, you to you darken the place, plus protect it and from storms, etc. Right, oh, so Dale, let's like everything in your head at once. <laughs> um, I tried uh, to remember it all. It's hard for my, my age to remember all this. <laughs> Um, so, uh, oh brain, sorry, I've lost it, Dale. What did you want to know? First, <laughs> oh, it was a... I'll tell you what the, about who, the ownership of it. So, um, this is This is late there all... in England, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it's late at night. This is uh, all my for... brain doesn't work either. <laughs> This is all for social rent. So the um, local authority is going to keep a hold of it um, and uh, rent it out, which is actually in the UK, that's the hardest thing for them to finance. The, um, the council in Norwich has also built a load of passive house homes, which it has sold on the open market and also um, at a, I, I call it a shared ownership. So it's a Pro, uh, the the occupants are able to buy back sections of the house over time. Um, so yes, they they have done that in other parts of the city, but this particular one is um, is very much is just for social rent, and that's seen as um, something very special. Okay, thanks, Sally. Scott Kennedy. So my question was fairly simple in how, when you did your PHPP, how much are you relying on the night ventilation through the townhouses as part of your cooling strategy? Um, so particularly because we didn't know who the occupants were going to be and we didn't know what kind of profiles they were going to um, use. Um, we instead of running like one scenario we ran a whole raft of different scenarios and i think this is really essential for this kind of building is um to look under you know if you said well actually if every single bed space was occupied and they had people in their living room too what would you need to do to make it comfortable um and we looked at that and we also looked at what actually happens if there's only one person in the house and um, so we did a number of different scenarios and then we're able to tell the um, talk to the client about those different cases and what the occupants might have to do to keep them comfortable so there were some of those scenarios where they had to do um, night venting um, and the reality is that it's very much in in real terms it will come down to how hot our summers become um, but they're also 
the and the strategy changed quite a bit between um, the houses and the flats. I mean, one of the real pluses um, that everybody was really keen to hold on to was that all of the homes have got at least two sides to them, which means that the opportunity for cross venting is a lot. So we did. Um, there are scenarios where we would expect them to be night venting, but it's not something which we're reliant on for everybody to do in are kind of in a normal summer. Okay, Jeff Spiratos, you got a, I think you got a quick question here, but I know uh, there are different sizes, but. Yeah, so uh, brilliant job, Sally. And uh, curious what your window sizes eventually came to since you were trying to shrink them. And what size would they need to be to avoid the shading on the south south face? Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good question. I'll have to. I will go away and uh, have a look at some of the drawings and have a look on the chat because it's been about. Um, I think they've been occupied for kind of nine months at least now. Um, but you can see it was kind of somewhere around about. Um, it was um, taking um, maybe twenty percent off the 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 height of the window meant that we had to, um, that additional depth meant that we had to do something. So that's the kind of a bit of a scale for it. So would you say that you, the windows are one meter by two meters or are they bigger? I've got a feeling, I don't think they're two meters. I think they might be like 1.6, something like that. And I think they may be, I'll, I'll go away and find out and I'll stick it on the chat. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, we've got Brian Wynn up next. Hey Sally, um, thanks for that great presentation. I actually have another question about the shades because in California that's hugely important and I was curious about the perforations in the shades and how you calculated that and whether they, you know, you looked at the solid version versus the perforated and how you, you know, how that all played out because it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm playing with a few of those things myself. <laughs> Well, this was, um, so obviously my dad is completely obsessed with the shading and uh, has, I just, you know, he's kind of gone into a whole different world about shading stuff and I'm trying not to go there. And so one of the things that we did actually fairly early on was the architect was really, they really, really wanted perforated shades. And so we just said, um, we made a very simple assessment of them in that we said that they were, they had an opacity of 50%. And it was, um, whilst we kind of checked that, that definitely there was, it was less, uh, less opaque than that in the other way around, that there was more material than that in the reality because we were mostly concerned about summertime. Um, beyond that, we didn't really do much more. <laughs> Did you use the, I mean, it looks like in the chat, Claire's recommending your shading tool um, in Australia. Hey, Claire. Oh, yes, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if uh, you played with the Design PH version of that shading yet, but. I don't know, you just use your, I think this was probably prior to that when you were consulting on this it. Was, this most definitely was, and um, I haven't, um, the um, the new version of Design PH, I think is uh, the previous version, the shading was absolutely awful. Um, mm. And this one is definitely massively improved on that one. And it may be something that we'd look at from that. But as Claire said, there's there's kind of, um, there are other mechanisms to kind of simply put a calculation in into PHPP from that. So definitely that the shading tool as well, which is a simple Excel spreadsheet that has been developed since we did this project. Nice, thank you. I think Laura, I think Bronwyn stole your question, but do you have any other questions regarding the shades? Oh, I'm there. Yeah. Okay. No, she, she covered it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Just want to make sure you uh, got your chance. That's all. Because the queue's a bit long. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Uh, Anthony, you had a question about uh, a glass. Sorry, I didn't get you up next, but uh, Anthony, you want to pop on? Oh, hey, Sally. Just wanted to say that um, the houses look really beautiful. Uh, I wanted to ask about the glass there. Um, did you consider putting in, um, I guess, any coatings on the glass? And what sort of glass 
did you end up using in the project? So these, um, the windows came from a company called Ideal Combi, um, which uh, we did loads of analysis of looking at different window manufacturers and both the price point and their um, efficiency in terms of heating energy and also daylighting. And um, then the architects went, uh, but we just found these really pretty ones. Please, 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 can we use these? Uh, which we were a bit like, seriously, guys, we've done all this analysis. Um, and we went with the pretty ones, which have got this incredibly thin frame. Um, and they had quite a limited, um, because the rebate on the glazing is quite small, um, they had um, a very limited range of um, glazing specifications that we could go with. So I've got a feeling that it was somewhere in the region of, um, it, I think it had a U value of 0.5 four or something like that and then a g value at uh kind of point um point five something so no there is there is uh they're kind of fairly traditional um glazed um and the other thing was that we really struggled with um information from this particular manufacturer as well um and one of the other things, just going back to um, the window opening, the other problem that we really struggled with them was their tilt and turn windows. And we really wanted them to be able to, in the turn mode, to kind of lock into place so that they don't just swing around, um, which a lot of windows tend to do if they're in tilt and turn. And that for ventilation is, is just really irritating and people don't tend to use them. And because the frames are so thin, there was a lot of limitations on them. So it was, um, we ended up building in quite a buffer in the other parts of the building design because there was so much unknown about these very pretty windows. So Justin. Yes, I'm here. Fire away with your question. Sure. Thank you, that was a, a great presentation, and great project. Um, so I, I, I think I, I may have missed it when you were talking about the nighttime flushing, but uh, what is the cooling strategy exactly? Is it just relying on the shading or what else are you relying on? Yes, yeah, so it's, um, we have, um, there is a small amount of um, window opening allowed for generally. Um, and it's, uh, but as I said, it, we, it kind of, we looked at different scenarios and if they are going to, um, use them more heavily. So if they occupied very densely, then they will have to um, open the windows more. Um, but it is a, um, it, it's in a back road in a bit of suburbia where actually that was the client felt really happy about their ability to open the windows securely. Okay, um, Michelle, you're up next. Yeah, my, my question was, um, uh, thank you, that was fabulous. I love what you've done. Um, and my question was, um, on the shading, I can't even remember my question. I asked <laughs> no my worries. question like I, so long ago. I got it for you. Uh, did you thermally break the shading attachments? Right, thank you. That's why yes. I'm here. Because you have a lot of, a lot of shading on that south facade. Um, so they one of the the construction is a timber frame and that meant that the outer face of it we could connect onto quite easily um and for the same with the brick in that we um the the brick ties that support the brickwork uh, that tie it back to the building system because it was a timber frame i mean this to me is um I feel that this solution of having a brick wall with the timber freight, which is only there as a facade, um, just feels very uncomfortable. It doesn't, you know, it's not there structurally doing anything or it's just an, it's just there as a weatherproofing. Um, and because of the um, embodied carbon involved in um, building that as well, um, we are looking at other cladding materials with the architects on future projects, um, which is really nice to see. But it's uh, the fact that we did have that timber frame behind, it meant that things like those, uh, 
those details just weren't a problem at all. What yeah. was a real problem is that if I just um, down the end, you can just see here on the these bits of brickwork here are all built off the balconies and those were a complete nightmare thermally and from an airtightness perspective the kind of because yeah. the thermal line steps in like this and goes up and this was just something where we said you cannot put brickwork above there and they were like oh but we really really want to and somehow yeah. they won and i don't even know how that happened but anyway there we go cool. can't win them Thank all you. All right, um, I think we'll have to take one question and then we're going to pause for a moment. So uh, that last person was Craig. Thanks, Sean. Sally, well done. That was a really enjoyable presentation. Simple bits are good bits. That's what I took away. So my question Got for it. you is, <laughs> so my question for you is from a PathVos perspective, I'm, I'm curious to see how the building's performing from an energy perspective but I heard you uh, reference thermal comfort so often in the presentation that that seems to have trumped maybe even your energy goals. So I was curious to see if you had any feedback loops or if you're getting any feedback from the occupants with regard to those goals. Um, it's really frustrating because the answer is no. And this is something which we, um, in our business, we love doing. We have a project which is 70 homes, which is, uh, was completed around about the same time and we're doing really detailed monitoring of that um, when it's not detailed but we're getting loads of feedback from the occupants and that's just as important as the numerical stuff um, and uh, we have talked over with the client with getting at least a basic level of monitoring in there and getting some feedback and unfortunately they've kind of said yes 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 we've just got a lot going on right now so we haven't quite got around to it and i'm just like please um the the other thing is because of um them winning the um sterling award award with this they've had everybody in their dog come and look around so the idea of having me walking around and asking them questions about their experience i think we've got to leave it a couple of years but i feel exactly the same you know i want that too i really want to understand it yeah thank you sally fantastic and i'll uh, in the in the after hour event i'll, I'll kind of comment uh, a whole bunch of great praise you've got but uh, i will turn it over to zach <laughs> 